right, welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest, I played against an A ball, double A, and in the big leagues. And we battled it out many a time from, he said, all the way up to the big leagues, especially when we were doing the silver boot when the Rangers used to play the Astros. And he has a tremendous story to tell, and we will get to that. But without further ado, my good buddy here, the old pitching reliever, Brandon Puffer. Puff, how are you, sir? Hey, Kevin. I'm doing great, man. I'm honored it, to be here with you guys. I appreciate you having me on. It's been a while, man. It has been a long while. It really has. It really has. I saw you pop up on Twitter and <laughs> a lot of tough memories of facing you and three, four punch you and Travis Hafner back in double A and then all the way through, like you said, some great battles, man. It's, it's great to catch back up. Gosh, it has been, it has been too long. I remember those, those days of, I think that whole group, we all kind of came through together, right? With, with that, from, I think starting in Kissimmee with yeah. uh, what I think was Lidge was there, was Bruntlet there as well. Yeah, you were there. Uh, that, Lidge, yeah, Redding. Yep. Um, gosh, a lot of good arms in that in that Round Rock team. Um, who else? Uh, Greg Miller. Yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of good dudes, man. Jason Lane was a part of that. Yeah. We all kind of did roll through together after that. I forgot about Laner. Yeah, he's uh, that just that bunch. I mean, we you know you said we talked about we just tended to battle it out for for years on end, and then you know we did the Silver Boot here in Texas doing the same thing. Um, you know, those, those were fun days. That's the stuff that we were, I think we remember most is playing against guys, at the lower levels, and then, you know, getting to the, to the ultimate goal of playing in the big leagues and just being a part of that. And, you know, what everybody went through, right. It was all, it was, it was business on the field, but I think, you know, outside of that, you know, we used to have a lot of fun, especially I think in a ball, I think is where it all started with those relationships and, you know, the, to yeah. see where guys went with their careers. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, man. Like you said, when you get at me through those lines, it's, it's all business and battle, but um, we're all shooting for the same goal. Right. And so we always just appreciated seeing guys make it that you battled against and just following the careers of guys. It's just always been really fun. So I, I agree with you, man. That's the part that, uh, that I miss is kind of camaraderie ship, not just with your teammates, but um, you know, with, with the guys you're battling against as well, you see them at the hotel or wherever. And it's like, you guys are all after the same goal and, and uh, we all created some great relationships, man. So it's so cool to come full circle here. Absolutely. Do you still keep in touch with any of those guys that you came came through with? I know you're living you're living in uh, Georgetown, right? Yeah, and yeah, exactly. I'm right here close to Round Rock. So um, yeah, I do. Yeah, I'll run into guys. So I actually coach. I have a program now. And so I'll run into guys out coaching. Um, Berkman's a head coach at HCU here. So I've tried to send him a few guys and keep in touch with Lidge a little bit. And also some of those guys, yeah. Um, yeah, you know how it is, man. You could go several years and nothing, and then you run into a guy at a tournament or just think about him, quick text or a message on Twitter, and you guys are right back to the old time. So it's pretty cool to, to keep up with guys like that. Um, Billy Wagner's another guy. He has a kid. He coaches. So we run into some of those guys as we play. Yeah, and it's and it's funny how the how the the guys are set up here in Texas. There's a big pocket up here in North Texas, and then yeah. you get into Austin. There's a big group there, and then there, I think there's a big group down south. So, you know, we're at that age now where our kids are, you know, intertwining as far as just you know being you know coaching and watching them grow up and you know and seeing it and telling the stories um, with with those guys of, you know, what we learned, but also even the stuff that we didn't learn, we're able to pass it along to you know other guys. Even if you know you weren't a, your kid, maybe a hitter now, an outfielder, right? So you talk, you run the guys that are pit that are hitters and having those those conversations, right? Because it's all a we it's all that group together of knowing, and it's that old school mentality that i think that we were a part of where, where you know the game now has become this new school you know mentality and it's tough so what you know as far as a coach what are you seeing with especially in that youth that youth age yeah man so we i normally stick with um coaching 17 new kids in the summer my passion is kind of helping advocate for them with going to the next level and things and then ironically we needed a guy in my program for the 14 year this spring and we're just looking. I'm like, you know what? Man, I, I can do this in the spring. So we had our first practice last night. And I was just talking about that with a guy that uh, he played a long time, man. And he was around. His son's on the team. And it's just kind of trying to figure out, like, yes, I am absolutely old school. Uh, probably to a fault at times. But um, and then, but on the, on the learning side, like, how do these guys learn? What are they going through? Like, I, I've tried to. I've been doing this about seven, eight years. And in the beginning, it was just like, man, this is what it's going to take. And no matter what, and I pushed pretty hard. And a couple kids shut down on me here and there. And it's like, okay, not that you're not going to hold them accountable. You absolutely are. And make them play the game right and run hard. And all those things that are very important. But, like, maybe learning some different styles of how to communicate with guys or who, who, 
who clicks to what? And I think that's nothing new. It's just new to me because I always had my one style and thought it worked for me. So it's going to work for everyone. And that's just not the case, man. They're going through a lot of different things these days. So um, trying to adjust. And if anyone heard me say that in my program, they'd be like, really? You getting soft in your old age? Because I actually had a message today. We have cage work tonight. And the guys are like, full uniform coach? I said, man, wear shorts. My other coach texts me on the side. He's like, whoa, you're getting soft, man. I said, oh, I guess I am. So just kind of learning different styles and evolving a little bit in terms of not how we feel about the game, not how we feel the game needs to be played, but how we kind of, you know, take these messages and help them be understandable for these young men. Yeah, because you've so, you know, being around what you've the pitching coaches that you've been through, uh, you know, like we've talked about just from from your lower levels, all of the big leagues, the different things that you've learned, you know, from those pitching coach, what have you taken from them and been able to utilize now with this younger, this younger generation? Because like we talked about that, it, the mentality is different from when you were pitching until now. Yeah, it, it is. And, and to your point, I'm so fortunate to have some great pitching coaches and the absolutes don't change a whole lot. Um, they do a little bit. So, I mean, I, I definitely, I'm always trying to learn and, and trying to get better. Um, but, for me, it's really, really about the mental side from the neck up and how do I help these guys who are maybe equal in talent become a little better? Because you know with what you did that that's, that's ultimately going to be the, the deciding factor is, you know, if two guys are pretty, pretty even, um, you know, physically in their tool set, then the mental, the routine, the consistency, the, all those things that I'm always hammering home, like just every time you play catch, every single time have an intended target you're not just throwing the warm up you know you're working on your command and just commanding the baseball and, and trying to you know that usually leads to some quality baseball win or lose of course we want to win every time but if we're good on our process and and we are um, getting after it, the energy levels there we're playing the best for our ability every day that's what i'm preaching every single day to these guys and then of course there's little mechanical things that you know we we turn out or whatever but at the end of the day for me it's always like how do we maximize this kid make him the best version of him and sometimes that's a little different from the next guy who's just super gifted and you just need to give him a pat and go hey go get him man and a lot of times it's it's to try not to overcoach right like just letting these guys feel free to go do their thing and make little adjustments along the way but not coaching the athleticism out of them that's what that's what i try to do and with our coaches in our program we have some great ones man some awesome guys who coach varsity ball forever and i'm always learning from those guys and it doesn't matter i'm sure you know this man the guys who didn't play sometimes are awesome coaches guys who didn't have a lot of talent undersized i'm thinking of one guy in our program right now had to battle for every single thing they got make awesome coaches and some guys who you know ha had some gifts and some talents they could just go do it a lot of times so just learning from everybody and, and their journey along you know their baseball journey whether it was just playing a little bit in high school or you know we've got some dudes i don't know if you remember guys like ludwig oh sure you remember him. i saw luddy last couple weeks ago at fan fest yeah yep. so luddy is kids on our on my team and brian gordon's kid and ryan Langerhands and all these dudes, man. So we're so fortunate to have men around these kids that a, you know, have the pedigree. They, they played, they did it. Um, a lot of them still doing it, but also are just so willing and humble to, to help, help out the kiddos. So it's, it's really cool, man. We're fortunate in that regard. So the, the older kids, I mean, they're the 17, 18 new kids are, you know, seniors in high school. Uh, mm -hmm. Are they, are they asking more questions to you, you know, about being at the next level, playing the next level, or is it more of, you know, they know, they know what they need to do and not ask the questions just about just trying to learn, or are they trying to actually dig into your mind and figure out what, you know, what the next step I need to take. So, you know, it's the mentality. I think, it, you know, the 18, you was probably a little bit different than the 14, you right. Because those kids, yeah. the younger ones are getting into high school as the ones that are getting out. Yeah. It's much different, much, much different. And, um, you know, across the board, Kiddos, they don't just they don't ask a lot of questions, man. They really don't. At the end of every practice, like, hey, you guys got questions? Hey, you got some guys around here? Pick their brain, you know. And they don't really ask questions per se, um, but they're open to learning for sure. Like they they don't come out with it. You have to kind of prod and ask questions and get to know them a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're very fortunate that um, you know we we don't we keep it pretty select. So it's not like just show up and pay and make up teams. So most of the guys we have are going to play at the next level or, you know, some of them are fortunate getting drafted and stuff like that. So they're, they're high level kids that are pretty driven. They know they want to play at the next level. So they're very open to um, things like that. I mean, we make them wear their uniforms, right? They show up in shoes. They show, you know, and th these are all kinds of things that people get bent out of shape about, but it's like, guys, let's just not let, one little thing even if it seems trivial be the thing that a scout or a coach kind of writes you off you know you, one time you don't run out of ball and you you know this uh at, you know, at these levels like you can get away with a little bit when you've been around a while so they watch guys on tv and they're like oh yeah i'm like no man that's not 
they're there. They've done their thing. They can they can do what they want to do. But for us, this is how we're going to play the game. And if, if you're going to get noticed, recognized, have an opportunity to play at the next level, I don't want any of these little, quote unquote, little things affect your opportunities. And so when you put it to them that way and you're not just being a stickler and you're on them about everything, it's like, man, this isn't for me. Trust me. This is for the guys that are scouting you, that have given me feedback saying, hey, man, we love how your guys show up and they're ready and they wear their uniform right and they're respectful and all these different things. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're open to it for sure, but there's just not a lot of questions being asked. You'll get the one or two, it's usually the same kid that always likes to ask questions and I, and I love it. I mean, that's, that's the only way to get ahead and learn is by, you know, proactively saying, Hey, you guys have been there. How do I get there? What do I need to work on? Um, and that's the other thing is working on the weaknesses. I think a lot of times they want to get in BP and jump ship or, you know, throw it as hard as they can or whatever. And it's like, guys, that's all good. Tool set's good. But, you know, if you can't throw strikes or have bat to ball contact, you may not last, last very long. Yeah, and we've we've noticed that we talk about the questions that kids don't ask. It, I think it, we were, I talked about this at a hitting clinic a couple weeks ago as far as kids seem to want to be told what to do as opposed to actually asking them, you know, saying, hey, what are you feeling? What are you thinking this process as opposed to what I think what they're used to is you're doing this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. And I think it's that input of where, you know, it just takes away from their ability to actually think, make the adjustment as opposed and and regardless of being told this is what you need to do. And I think that's probably where the questions don't come from because they're just used to being told, right? You, I mean, as a coach, that's what, that's what I've noticed. And that's the hardest part is figuring it out be, is asking that question, right? Who's got questions? Nobody does. And come on, guys, you have the questions. It's almost like they're afraid to ask. They're afraid to make mistakes. Are yeah. you noticing that? 100%, man. I, I was in the back of my mind when you were talking, I was thinking about that is, um, you know, I had this talk just last night again, it was first practice. And it's like, Hey man, you know, I'm going to know guys a little bit. And I'm like, Hey, what, what's your strength? Like, what, what, what do you do? Well, or we're doing bullpens. Hey, what, what are your weaknesses? What do you want to work on? And they're like, uh, like you just tell me. <laughs> and I go, well, you, you got, you know, yourself better than I do. Right. And, and you're your own best coach. So help me help you in that regard. And then, um, yeah, a lot of times they don't know. Right. And so the other thing is one of the first things I say is I'm like, look, everyone in this circle is going to make a lot of mistakes. Like it's baseball. We're going to mess up. Feel free to do it, man. The only thing I care about is how you respond to it, how, what your body language looks like. And we'll learn from there. It's the only way we're going to learn. So if, if you free them up a little bit and um, let them know, like, Hey man, it's, it's all good. Just get, get the next one, get guys kind of chirping them up and, and let them know, Hey, get the next one. You're good. Typically they'll loosen up a little bit and they feel free to play their best. Um, I have it happen a lot in the summers where guys rake and then they go back to school and they just they struggle and, guys are like what's going on I'm like I don't know man it might just be a little bit too much uh, management of the swing and the mechanics and we're gonna do it this way we do it at this school is how we do it rather than hey man you're very athletic you could roll out of bed and hit let's get your mind right and get a good approach and go up there and just let you do your thing so freeing them up a little bit I, I find helps helps let them play their best their best yeah that their mind gets in their own way you talked yeah. about that. That's and that's the problem. I think it's this generation is just input, input, input. Right? That's all they want. And it yeah. and if they can't learn to ask the questions to, to be you know to be proactive in what they're doing, they're then they're not going to understand their bodies and everything else. So it's almost as if they've never had the ball put in their court and understanding. You talk about from the beginning of. of um, you know, the, just the body mechanics itself of being able to stand. Well, you know, I kind of felt my, you know, why that ball do that? Well, my arm drop. Now you're learning. You're teaching yourself. You don't need the coaches there. And I can understand it, the younger kids, but I think it's if, if they don't start younger, by the time they get to your, you know, that 18 you age, it's kind of, you know, you don't know anything. You know, you're just here the type of thing, yeah. right? So that's what you're seeing. Yeah. Um, and that's the hard part of coaching is being able to tell them to understand that if we can start it younger, they're able to figure that out. And I think they have more room to grow that way because, yeah. you know, they get like you said, they get in the game and then all of a sudden they freeze up. They think way too much. You know, you talk about playing great in the summer and then they get over here. Well, what something where's the disconnect, you know, from what you were doing to what their coaches are doing. Right. Do you have those conversations with them to kind of get them back on, on board with the, the one concept of what they're trying to accomplish? We sure do, man. We do. And I'll, I'll get those text messages from a kid or a parent. I had, I had this conversation with a high school parent yesterday and he's struggling and we don't know. And he did so well this fall. And, and it just simply comes down to um, the confidence and, and feeling free to be themselves. And then um, to our point about, you know, kind of micromanagement and input, 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 there's nothing better than, a, you know, kid throws a pitch, sails it, bounce it, whatever. And he looks back and goes, oh, I know what I did. And, and I'm always asking, what'd you do? 
you give me the feedback. What'd you do? And when they get it, it's great. But then what I also notice is sometimes, hey, they get it. And that is great. And then every time they miss a spot, like, oh, I did this. I did that. I did it. And I'm like, no, it's good, man. <laughs> You're just going to miss spots sometimes. Like, it's all good. Just relax. Make the adjustment next pitch. We don't have to talk mechanics every single pitch. We don't have, you know, occasionally, you know, yes, there's some checkpoints. But again, just allowing them. And you know this from playing this game, man, it's tough. And if you're not free to just kind of get in your own flow and have some some good energy, free to fail, absolutely, um, then it can be pretty tough. So, you know, the, the dance is giving them the right tools, you know, feeding them a lot of positive energy, making them feel 10 foot tall and bulletproof. Because um, all you can really ask is just your best, man. What You're 100% of what you have today. And some days you're going to feel like crap. So just give me what you have today. Um, and then they just, there's freedom. At the end of the day, they can look in the mirror and we as coaches can look in the mirror and go, yeah. We gave them absolutely everything we had today, man. Win or lose, we did. And um, and that's what I always tell them, especially at this level. It's like, man, I want to win every game. I'm I'm cutthroat. I love to win. I hate to lose. Like, I know you do because you made it to that level. But it's like, but winning and losing at this level is different. Like, you might lose a game against a really good team. You battled them, man. You left bumps and bruises and fought all the way through. And that's a win, dude. You guys, are, that was awesome. And we're going to learn from that adversity and move on. Or you might boat race a team, but you were lazy and they weren't very good. And like, that's it's not really a win you didn't develop you didn't get better so just kind of remembering what we're trying to accomplish especially at the younger levels it's not about rings and wins and again we love to win everybody does but uh looking for ways to celebrate victories within that Um, and for me it's just all about their effort yeah so so the kids the ones that ask the questions that are more in tune to not you, you talked about the one kids that are overthink oh my gosh i did this this and this as opposed to all right, I understand this moving. Which ones do you think have better success long term with are the ones that, that that understand themselves that you know that don't do too much but do enough to where they need to or the ones that don't ask the questions? I mean, that's I think that's a big question for all the coaches at this point. Yeah. What what are you seeing? What are you thinking about that whole situation? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I feel like it's um there's a happy medium there, right? You definitely want to be proactive in questions and um, learning from your coaches and making adjustments and o- always evolving for sure. And then you can get that over cerebral, like thinking about every pin. I see those guys, even in just a bullpen, it's just me and them. We're in a cage, man, there's no pressure, nothing going on here. And every pitch is like grind. The wheels are grinding, man. Smoke's coming out of the ears. And I'm like, dude, relax. Like, I, I don't think that's a really sustainable way to play the game, um, especially for a long time. Cause as you know, you, I mean, if you're beating yourself up all the time and, and I, I feel like I did that a little bit, I didn't let myself enjoy it as much as now looking back and like, man, I wish I would have like on the field. I loved everything off the field, but on the field, just putting all that pressure on yourself is tough. And so uh, the fine line between, Hey, you know, because then again, I've also watched guys throw bullpens and they'll just go, 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 go. You can't get a word in They're in their next, their, their legs up, they're ready to go. And you're like, Whoa, hold on, dude hold on. So finding that happy medium for me between, and I'm not a super sharp guy. So I was never a real cerebral guy. So uh, I know there's some dudes that that make a living by, you know, always being on video and always checking the camera. So um, no knock on guys that works for, but I've seen at the younger levels, guys overthinking a little bit, maybe being a little too cerebral and we just give them some positive self-talk. Like, Hey man, you're not gonna be able to stop your thoughts. They're going to come regardless. But let's let's throw in a hey, one pitch at a time, pound the zone, or hey, trust your stuff, and just keep repeating that over and over. Because right now, all your other thoughts are getting in the way of what you're trying to do, and so um, let's just kind of like replace those thoughts with some good positive ones, and typically that'll help the guys like that. So, so do, they, do the kids ask about you know your 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 professional career from when you were drafted, you know, going through? Because you talk about that situation that some of them are gonna go play professional baseball and the grind of of what it takes. I mean, some guys go from you know getting drafted, they play a year, two years, and in the big leagues. Some guys don't, you know, play eight, nine years in the minor leagues before they get it. I mean, have they talked to you at, at all about what your 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 progression was from draft to getting finally getting to the big leagues? They do, you know, typically they will ask some questions about that, but you know how it is. It's more like, Hey, did you face Barry Bonds? Hey, did you face, Hey, how was this? You know, it's, it's stuff like that kind of the cool stuff. And that's fun to talk about. Um, it's not usually like, how do I better prepare for this grind? And I was that guy I was that, I think it was eight or nine years before I, I, I got up there. So, um, man, when I, when I do have those conversations with guys, I'm honest. I mean, Hey man, yeah, it's, it's long bus rides and it's PB and J's and it's, you know, Roach Moach hotels or, you know, Roach coach, whatever. <laughs> But at the end of the day, I'm like, dude, what else would you rather be doing? For me, it was nothing. Like people ask, how do you get through that? Like, how do you 
what's your mindset? I'm like, just being grateful. Like every single day, long bus ride, struggle, you know, Tulsa just beat us up because mentioned Hafner went off again. And uh, uh, it's like, dude, w- okay, what else would I really be doing? And when teammates of mine would be like, man, this sucks. I wish I was home. It's like, dude, I bet you if you went in there and asked your release, they'd give it to you. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, no, no, I don't mean that. That's not what I mean. So it's just being grateful and not complaining and just being like, dude, this is, this is what we signed up for. And this has been a dream of mine since I was, you know, I can, as long as I can remember. And if that's your dream, these are the things that are going to happen, but that should be nothing compared to what you're trying to accomplish, you know? Yep. And that's what, and I, and I always, people always want to tell, hear stories about, well, what was it? Yeah, you know, what did you like you said they face Barry Bonds or this and that they go you can go Google that stuff, right? Yeah, don't don't yeah, go yeah. find a one to talk about Google. Ask me what it actually feels like to be playing in uh oh gosh, where where was I'm trying to think of your rookie ball team that we played. Uh was it Martin? Maybe it was Martinsville, I think, was where I played against. And then then moving up we played in I think you were what, Asheville? Is that where you played in the Sally League? I was in the side league um, in Asheville with the Rockies at one okay. point. I wasn't with Houston in Martinsville, and then you probably faced them in Battle Creek maybe in the Midwest League. I don't know. No, I went right um, from there, too. We played them in Martinsville. I can't yeah. remember who was there. That was, gosh, over 20 years ago. And then it was in the yeah. Florida State League is where all the guys – I missed. I played in the side league for a week. I heard the, the horror stories of bus rides from Columbus, Georgia, to all the way up to Delmarva. Oh, yeah, man. No, the side league was real with the travel. I was uh, in Charleston, West Virginia – my first go around for the Sally league and then in Asheville for a little bit as well. And then um, moved over to the Houston organization in 2000 in Kissimmee, which is where we, you know, we, we faced you guys. And I really remember the Tulsa round rock uh, matchups a lot. Those were, those were good battles for sure. Yes. I do miss, miss those days. And that was a, that was a long league travel league is really uh, as well. You know, we're in Tulsa and then you uh, going up to Wichita or down to El Paso and everything else. But I think that's, those are the kind of, trips that made it it fun where that camaraderie really built in because you know florida state league i think was by far the best league that you can play baseball in i mean three hours trips for the most you guys were in Kissimmee, so you were kind of you know right in the middle of that but you know you're 22 years old you're in ebor city in tampa half the year or yeah. you're on the beach right and that, that's by far the the best league you I, you could play in um you know because it's you get rained out batting practice rained out so you're out yeah. all the time right you every every day it was rained out didn't matter four o'clock it rained yeah. right and yeah. then you go play and then you go out and have a good time and sleep and then go hang out at the beach and then and then go and then all of a sudden now we're in the texas league where there's nothing but long bus rides and you're looking at empty <laughs> empty fields going from tulsa to san antonio on a bus right yeah. doing this stuff and missing but that's where that camaraderie's built on that bus of, because that's where that that jump is but that same core group of guys right make right. that jump and then uh and then and that's the things that kids the stories that they can't see online right the google stuff that well what was it like riding these buses what is, yeah. trust me you, you figure out a way to get out of that riding those buses as fast as you can right these kids think now everything's going to be handed to them that there's no there's no work ethic are you noticing that too with these with these i mean these older kids especially getting ready for that yeah, I do. And I don't think there's any, unless they've had a family member go through it or they've, they've been good about having these conversations. I don't think there's any way for them to really wrap their head around what it's like when you get into to minor league ball. We've got a few guys in there now and they'll text back and ask questions. And then they're like, oh man, I didn't know it was like this. Um, so it's pretty hard. And I didn't know what to expect. I, I know you probably didn't either. And then the, the ironic part of it is, is you're like, bus rides stink and I can't wait to get to AAA where we can fly. And then you're like, dude, put me back on the bus. <laughs> we got a four o'clock uh, wake up call at the hotel for that 6am flight. And then you get in, it's like, you know, you just got home at midnight, you're winding down like those travel days and the PCL. I literally was like, man, I'd rather bus. I'd rather go back and bus. I don't know about you, but I was a big bus guy. I didn't like doing the airport thing. No, especially when you, you're going from, you know, Tacoma to, I can't imagine going to New Orleans, everything at least flew through DFW, which was yeah. if good, but you know, those, those, those layover flights and you're playing that night, you're getting in at four o'clock going right to the ballpark and playing. It's, it's not as easy as people think playing in triple a. So it's, but you're right. Some of the bus rides, but I also heard some of those bus rides through the Midwest league are pretty long and, and uh, arduous as well. Yeah, no, no, there's no doubt, man. I mean, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. The bus rides, the travel, the hotel, all those things, you know, the my, you know, my leagues now have some really nice stadiums, but there's some depending on what league you were in then that were a little dilapidated and I'll never forget um signing out of high school and the minnesota twins sent me the the folder and on the cover it was like a sold out fourth of july crowd for the for the fort myers miracle for that team 
I'm going, dude, look what we're going to. This is going to be phenomenal. And then you show up and you're like, no, 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 you guys are playing at noon on the side field every day uh, with like two family members and maybe maybe a couple girlfriends in the stands. And I was, I literally had no idea until I showed up. I was like, wait, what? I thought we were playing, you know what I mean? So just those little things you learn along the way. And now you look back and, and laugh at them and go, man, my rookie ball team, like I was in like 11 organizations, you know, long time. And I still keep in touch with probably five or six of those guys because we were all 18 fresh out of high school trying to survive. And that's when you build some great relationships. Yeah. Th- that's definitely a part of it, especially being out of high school. You, you don't, you don't know much, you know, you got kids have a lot of money that age and you know, a lot of, a lot of trouble can follow that. You know, we've seen those guys that have, that have, that have been through that, you know, going from high school right into pro ball and people always ask, is, is college better than going? It, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, you some play so many games in high school. You get into to college, you play more, but you get, then you get into pro ball. You're playing. It depends on what level you play. Ninety games, you're playing 120 games. So I mean, it it can wear on you, and it and that's where it starts, right? Where how we play, how we handle ourselves, and carry ourselves, and that where it really develops. Whether you can do this or not, and that's that mental part that where it starts, right? That's it, man. That's what I always tell guys. I'm like, literally, man, it's a war of attrition. That's what it is. I mean, if you're willing to outlast everybody else, and, and of course. You know, some good things have to happen. You have to be healthy. You have to get some breaks. I mean, there's no doubt. But at the end of the day, it's like guys just give up before it's their time. Yep. It's like don't just don't give up, man. And and to your point, uh, you know, I was I was thinking about this earlier. Is um, yeah, I mean, you know, for the for the kids that want to do it, and that's that's their goal, and that that's the only thing they've ever dreamed of doing. Then you'll be able to handle any of that stuff. You'll be focused on the prize. And if if not, then you're going to allow some of those, you know, hey, man, I'm homesick. I'm tired. I'm struggling. I'm in the sun, whatever. My arm's hanging and I still got to get out there and do it. That's when you're going to find out what you're made of. Um, that adversity is really going to be what happens. And then also a point you brought up earlier, a, a lot of times I do get that question of because, you know, typically, hey, coach, did you go to college? I didn't. I signed out of high school. Oh, is that what, you're, what you should do? I was like, absolutely not. I mean, that's that's a personal decision. It, everyone's different. You know, school is for some guys. Some guys really struggle with it. I struggled with it. So I took my opportunity. But man, I had a lot of good buddies go off. And I had one guy get drafted out of high school. His name was Pete Zamora. We were drafted the same year out of high school. He went to UCLA, went to college. I went to rookie ball. We met up in double A. So it was like the road to the to the big leagues out of college and high school is pretty similar. You're just going to kind of bypass probably some of that rookie ball stuff if you go to college and get some great experience and get your education. And uh, man, college baseball, I wasn't into it because I didn't play it. And now that I do this and I watch our guys, it's exciting, man. I'm like, I, yeah, maybe, maybe we did miss a little something by not going and doing that uh, for me. But um, yeah, that's a big question. And, and I just real careful to let guys know like, hey, that's the road I took. I wouldn't change my path, but at the end of the day, that was for me. And that, that doesn't mean that's the way to go for you. You know, everyone's a little different with their situation. Yeah. And you talk about, you played, you know, a lot of years in the minors, played in the big leagues for a few years and then back, you know, back to the minors trying to fight through that grind um, and talking about it. And so as you know, some guys hang on to hang on, you know, I don't, don't know why. Cause like you said, it's a personal experience of what guys deal with. Was that, was that part of your story when you got, you know, going back into the minor leagues at, you know, after playing in the big leagues, it, you know, being there for eight years, you're in the big leagues and all of a sudden you're back in the minor leagues. Is that, that mentality? Was, was that, is that why you, you continued through those minors because you were trying to get back to it or was it something else you were chasing or, or what was it? Yeah, I think it was, it was hanging on. Um, I tend to be an optimistic guy, maybe to a fault. And it was like, man, I, I, if I just get on a roll, you know, I'm one call away all the time. And, and I think that's true to an extent, but then um, towards the end, the last two seasons, it was more trying to transition. I always kind of want to be that lifer, right. That like played X amount of years, coached and just, you know, I wanted to be a big league bullpen coach. That was kind of my next goal. And so the Rangers gave me an opportunity to kind of uh, go back to double A as the old guy, go Bull Durham, a little Crash Davis on him, and just kind of be that mentor to the young guys. They had some great young prospects at the time that I know you, you, you know, coached or played with some of them, like Elvis Andrews and Chris Davis and Derek Holland and Edison Volquez. Anyway, just a great team. And so I, I was honored to take on that role. I would have done that as long as they wanted me to. And then the conversation every few weeks would be like, something about coaching. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not ready. I'm not ready for that. And um, I truly in my mind was able to convince myself even in double A and I just had one decent season. I, 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 you know, pitched all right. And I was like, 
man, I'm, I'm going to get back to the big leagues. I'm going to get back to the big leagues. And the writing was pretty much on the wall. It wasn't going to happen. But um, I enjoyed that mentor role. So I would have done that as long as they would allow me to and then transition into coaching. And, of course, you know, I, I end up derailing myself, um, just making one bad decision, one bad choice. And so now it's like you have your plans. And now, okay, uh, my plans are a little bit shot now. What do we do with, with life uh, without baseball for a little while? And I had to really learn some lessons. And, man, probably the best thing that ever happened to me because, um, as you know, the pursuit in baseball is very, very selfish. I mean, it's very just about you and it has to be because you're always trying to get that edge. And um, so as a person, and especially now as a coach who didn't plan on coaching young kids or having a youth program, um, it, it really ended up being the best thing for me. Um, Cause I would have probably just hung on and continue to coach and that lifestyle being gone all the time and away from your family. And I mean, you know, I got buddies still doing it and, and they do what they got to do. And that's what we're used to. But uh, I feel really blessed to be able to do what I'm doing now. And I just don't think that ever happens if I, you know, again, just kind of went after my plan, which was, okay, let's, let's ride this thing out as long as I can. I honestly, my goal is to pitch 20 years. I don't think that would happen because I was at 15 and I was, <laughs> I was waning a little bit, but um, then, you know, being that bullpen coach and pouring into guys, I just liked the lifestyle, I liked the clubhouse. Like you said, I liked the bus rides and the flights and being around the guys and encouraging or cutting up or whatever we had to do to keep it loose um, but yeah, it's just, that wasn't the plan. And so, um, back to your original question. Yes. I was just trying to hang on as long as I could. I was, a, I was one of those, like they got to rip the uniform off me type deal. Um, and then also I wanted to transition to coaching. So that seemed like the best route. And you talk about, you know, we, we talk about Google and everything else, you know, Googling your name and stuff comes up and you talk about the, the one bad decision that you made, um, you know, everything that, yeah. that we do creates a path. It's, you know, scars are there for a reason, a reminder of what we've done wrong, but they, you know, they, they change, you know, our path forward. And they, you know, there's a great quote by C.S. Lewis. Yeah. yeah, you can't go back and change the past, but you can start now and change the future. So that decision that you talked about that okay. you made and moving forward, can you ex explain to people, you know, what, what happened? Like I said, you can read on Google and like, Internet's 100% truth. We oh, all know yeah. that, of course. So, but just, you know, yeah. after we talked the yeah. other day, this story, explain and just tell me, you know, how this, you know, what, what really happened and how this really affected you and how this, I'm sure the, the lessons you're able to teach now. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I'm happy to, and um, you know, I'm an open book about this stuff. So when I share it, people are sometimes like, whoa, I didn't know you're you did write a book about it. Correct. But I, I mean, I literally, I, I, I literally wrote a book about it, so I'm an open book about it. And the reason I did that, and people ask me a lot, like, Man, is that hard to share? Is that? And it is. Um, but my goal is to encourage two types of people, really. Um, one, you know, the young man or woman, or even it doesn't have to be young, struggling with addiction, making good choices, kind of thinking, you know, what's one compromise going to hurt me? It's not a big deal of really being aware of their choices because in my life, and I'll, I'll say it here in a second, uh, one choice, one night literally did change my life. I flipped it upside down. And um, also, you know, folks have already made a bad choice, you know, on the back of my book, it's like, you're so much better than your worst mistake. I think that guilt and shame people carry when they've made a mistake, um, maybe not as big as mine, or maybe, but they just have a hard time getting past it. And I remember feeling that way. Um, I remember feeling that way when I was in it going, man, there's no, what is life after this? Is anybody ever going to, you know, want to trust me or, or love me or have relationships or whatever. Um, and it was really hard to work through that. And, you know, it's, it's a lifetime thing you work through. So I'm trying to encourage others with my story in that regard. And really mention what happened, man, is um, I had had addiction all throughout my life. My dad battled with addiction. Um, he, he became sober, gave his life to Christ when I was like in high school. So it really kind of opened my eyes to, man, there's a, there's a, there's some truth to this. I mean, this is something I need to, I need to pay real close attention to. I watched my dad change his life. My mom, was always, you know, just faith filled, literally dude. She's like Mother Teresa, man. She's she's a pastor at Saddleback Church. She's uh, you know, just whatever. But I was I kind of resented her faith because I was like, man, this just doesn't seem real to me. I've never known her to make a mistake or to be human, which I'm sure she does and has, but just a real solid rock. And so when my dad changed, I was like, wait a minute, there's something to this. So moving through my career and even my life, um, it was always a battle. It was like, you know, the nightlife, the free time. Um, any of that stuff was just hard for me, man. Like the mental health of anxiety, this was really on, on top of me forever, man. It was a battle, still is. 
So I've got to be very intentional about um, my routines and my programs and stuff like that. But um, I basically, you know, I gave my life to Christ in 1998 in A-Ball, got sober for about five years. I'm giving you some real cliff notes here. Um, that's when my career really took off. I was, I was sober from uh, 1999 through 2004. And so you're taking care of yourself. You know, you always talked about the grind of baseball. If you're out there, you know, not getting enough sleep and you're hooting with the owls, eventually it's going to catch up to you when you're trying to soar at the Eagles. And that would, that would happen to me a lot. But when I was sober and working out and my mind was right, and I was in my Bible and prayer and, and just reading and trying to better myself and, you know, mental side of baseball book, just really just trying to improve my mind and my body, my career really took off. And that's where I got an opportunity to make the big leagues a little bit and stuff like that. And then in 2004 and spring training with the Padres, um, I, I got separated from my first wife. I was away from my daughters for the first time and not really having the same communication. It was a really hard time, man. And now adversity hit and like, how firm is my foundation? How firm is my faith? Yeah. You've been sober, you've been doing what Christians are supposed to do. You know, I'm not going out on the road and all these things, but at the end of the day, my faith, uh, wavered when that happened, I was out on my own. And those, those little voices of, man, that was five years ago. You were young, you were a knucklehead. I bet you could do this now and be mature about it. Because I always wanted to be that guy that could go out socially, have a drink or two, shut it down, and we're good. I just wasn't that guy, man. I was Frank the Tank. I didn't have an off switch. <laughs> and um, every time it was like, fill it up again, man, when it touches my lips. And so I'm an all or nothing guy, Menchie. And, and I uh, I snuck back into those habits a little bit, started slow. Spring the slippery slope, forth. for sure. <laughs> yeah. And that's how it happens. Right. It's like, okay, so moving forward, that's kind of just setting the stage for what happened. Um, I would, from that point on, I went, I went off the rails for a couple of years, Oh, four to like, Oh, six. And then really was like, man, this is not what I'm about. I know better. Um, I was raised better. I, I got to try to get this back on track, but once you let it back in, it's tough, man. So I was doing better. Um, I alluded to an 07, 08. I went back to double A with the Rangers as the old dude. I had a little bit of time and kind of a uh, bull Durham style. And those young guys, man, they were asking me to go out every night. They were yeah. like, oh, if you're the old guy, you know, it's kind of the mentor, the FCA leader, all these things that, but I was still struggling and I didn't want these guys to know that um, I didn't want to let them down. They looked up to me. I didn't want them to know that I was struggling. So I never went out with them, but I'd go out on my own and kind of just live that double life and eventually caught up with me towards the end of the season on uh, September um, 13th. We were in the championship double a um, I was with Frisco and uh, I was thinking, man, I was driving to the yard, you know, routine, been doing this 15 years. It's like, pick up my, my food, head in early, play some cards, go see the fellas. And I just had this thought of like, you know what? And, and they would say it all the time. They're like, Puff, it's just one night. Can you just do one night with us? And I literally told these guys, I'm like, man, I can ruin my life in one night, guys. Like I, I've had some near misses and I, it's just not, it's not healthy for me, man. But on that Friday, I compromised and I said, hey guys, I'll, I'll go out. And they were pumped. And and I, I was I was excited too. I was like, man, I'll go have some good time with these young guys, been battling all year together. And, um, you know, Frank the Tank came out. I just had no off switch. And what I ended up doing, man, a lot of people think this is just absolutely crazy. And then a lot of people, especially guys who played ball, are like, man, I can see that. Um, I basically, at about 3 in the morning, I was uh, at an apartment with some guys you probably know, um, our clubhouse manager, Brandon Boyd, and uh, <laughs> Terry Clark, our pitching coach, had said, man, you're not driving. Come stay with us. And I did. And, and they kept saying, go to bed, Puff. And I'm like, no, I got a friend out here that's having a party. I'd stayed at the same apartment complex the year before. And there was a, a young lady, really, really cool, like mid twenties, had a daughter and was always inviting us up to party. And I, I wasn't drinking at the time. And I would always decline. And I said, I'm gonna go see if she's having a party. And obviously right now you're going three in the morning. What, what are you doing? But at the time in my mind, the lifestyle I was living, the things I was doing, I thought that that was going to be, um, you know, that was gonna be okay. And so I went over there, knocked on the door, no answer, obviously, three in the morning, stranger. Um, and I and it was unlocked, man. And I walked in, which was the stupidest thing you could ever do, next to the next thing I did, which was I tried to jump in bed with her. And um, embarrassing is all get out. But when you live a lifestyle that way, not everybody did. Um, some guys were great and they were family guys and they they lived they played baseball and didn't partake in all that, which is so commendable and respectful. But you know, I had already compromised and and, and lived a lifestyle like that and thought that was gonna be okay. So I ended up the next morning. I don't remember any of that. I was blacked out. Um, uh, what happened was she screamed, which is the most hurtful part of the story for me is this young lady had her life interrupted by my stupid decision. Cause I decided to go out and drink. And, um, the next day, um, I was in orange jumpsuit and I woke up 
And um, Boyder was there to bail me out. And I said, man, what happened? How did I get here? What the heck's going on? How'd you know I was here? And he said, you called me last night and I was hoping you were kidding, but came down just to, just in case. And um, sure enough, man, I got the paperwork and burglary rehabilitation with intent to commit a sexual assault, which is just, just awful. I mean, still pit in my stomach when I say it, but it, that that's what I got charged with and uh, ended up going to a jury trial, um, finished the season, you know, pitched champs again the next day. We had like two more days. I didn't tell anybody anything. Um, and then the media got a hold of it. And so, okay, not as, you know, you're only as sick as your secrets and they say what happens in the dark is coming out in the light. That was very true. I thought I'm just going to sweep this under the rug, right? It's going to be fine. And um, the media got a hold of it a couple weeks later. And then um, the district attorney there, I believe where you live, picked it up. And and I said, okay, man, it's time to face your, your you make the choices, you face the consequences. And I went and got a five-year prison sentence. And then she got a five-year prison sentence. I served three and a half years, um, man. But I tell you what, and I always share this. It, I never, I always had a God-shaped hole in me that I tried to fill with baseball and performance and women and, yep. you know, partying and fighting, all these things, you know, man. And, mm-hmm. and I, I just never filled it. I never had peace and joy. I had minimal, you know, a little bit of happiness and uh, you probably wouldn't know it by hanging around with me, but it was just always that inner struggle. And when I got locked up and really had to pay attention to not, Hey, I can cover everything up by just going to be a good ball player or doing whatever. Um, I need to really be a good human being and I need some humility in my life and all these different things that are certainly going to come with prison um it was just a whole new heart and a whole new uh, mind for people and um i had peace and joy walking out in there it wasn't like hey when i get out i'm gonna have peace and joy now it's like no man learn how to have peace and joy where you are like an eight by ten cell no matter what you're doing um got out three and a half years later uh you'll laugh at this man that that the dell diamond where we battled so many times reed ryan's like hey man you know i can get a job for you i mean i, I pretty much can't go apply at mcdonald's probably and get a job so what am i going to do and uh, he's like, hey, we got a job for you, but all we have is a maintenance guy. I'm like, dude, I can't fix anything, but I'm in. And uh, <laughs> I spent a whole, uh, I don't know, probably four or five months. Uh, pressure, I pressure washed every inch of concrete at that stadium, painted all the walls, painted the suites, stained everything. And was just loving every minute of it, man. And guys would be like, how did you pitch in the double All-Star game on that mound? And you're okay with just cleaning up around here. And I'm like, Cause I've got that peace now, man, that God, only God can give you. And I just, whatever I'm doing, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do with everything I have. And that's the thing. It's that's kind of like dragging the field, pulling the tarp, right? That, that That's that, that love for the game of understanding the work that goes into it and knowing that, you know, coming out that, because, you know, I know that it's, it's, you're, you're labeled one thing, right? This, when this, when this is regardless of what, you know, what happened, people relate, it's already labeled. Baseball has always been that way. Five minutes to label five years to get rid of it. But for, for Reed to come to you and say, Hey, I've got something for you. I mean, grateful because of, you know, you, like you think you you've hit rock bottom and there's nothing left and all you're doing, like you said, you've just got your hands up praying, you know, praying and saying, and there's Reed saying, Hey, I've got something for you. So, you know, so doing that, the mentality, I mean, coming out, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on, uh, you know, what you can do really, right? I mean, you're, like you said, you couldn't get a job at McDonald's and then, and then here's this miracle of Reed Ryan waiting for you. You know, what, what goes through your mind as, as, as you're going through this? Man, honestly, just how good God is. And, And that's, there's, there's a whole redemption story, you know, the past nine years I've been out and the little steps taken and where I am now. And, just it's just how good is God, man? And, and you find out who your real friends are when you're in there. And, and it's no, no offense to anybody I didn't hear from. They didn't, it wasn't their choice. They don't owe me a thing. But like Reed would write me and send me books along with tons of great buddies that I have. Um, and he, he did say, you know, look us up when you get out. And I you know that was one thing I struggle with. Man, she is like, dude, baseball's my whole life. I love it. But am I going to, is baseball going to have anything to do with me after this? Like, well, how's this going to work? And so just being in a stadium was kind of cool. It's like, hey, God's got such a humor. I'm in a stadium. This is good. And then little by little, man, like one person reached out to me and asked about a pitching lesson. And I was blown away, man. I was humbled. I literally just thought, who would want me to do a pitching lesson anymore? If they're, you know, that's the guilt and shame I carried. And, you know, that started going okay. And then um, a couple more picked up and they were letting me do them there at the stadium, which was just amazing. I'd get off work and paint and stain all over me and give a lesson. I just loved it, dude. It was like starting over again with the grind. And I literally started over and by the way, man, like everything that I made in baseball, which wasn't a lot, <laughs> was trying, was spent trying to 
stay out of prison and hire attorneys and then taking care of my responsibilities while I was in there. So man, literally do when I say start over, like it was over for uh, like scratch. And um, that turned into like, they promoted me to a baseball outreach coordinator. Um, now that started giving me confidence. Cause it was like, man, they trust me enough to, to do this. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give it all I have and I'm going to, I'm going to do well and started some teams. And that all kind of transpired into where um, um, Gordo and I, Brian Gordon and I, took a little leap of faith and started our own program that from scratch with one team. And now we've got, I don't know, 25, 30 teams and like 300 families and kids we get to impact all because just humbly just taking one step, putting one foot in front of the other. And the guy kept going, okay, if you're, if you're faithful in this, now I've got this, if you're faithful in this. Now I've got this. So that's what I always encourage people to do. Like, just be humble in what you're doing now. Don't just keep looking forward to if I had that, I'd be happy. Or if I did that, then I'd be happy. Trust me, man. And you know, this, it, You've been around these guys. Like I thought making the big leagues was going to do it. I thought first big league win might do it. I thought, you know, world series ring, although I didn't, <laughs> didn't deserve it was going to do it. I, you know, all these things and they just don't do it, man. So it's like, just be humble in the little things you're doing, be where your feet are now. And then you'll be exalted and lifted up to do more. And that's what I found, you know, in my life, just humbled, man, the redemption with my kiddos and um, my, my new wife and just things that you're like, I don't know if, I have a normal life again after this. You do, and you can. And that's a big encouragement for how I wrote the book. It's like, yes, to be real about the choices and what I did and, you know, my, the prison life for that, that long. But more than that, it's like redemption of like, hey, man, look at all that. And then now look what God's doing in my life. Um, and But there's got to be behavior change. There's got to be humility, um, you know, true humility. Otherwise, it's just, if it's just like, yeah, man, I went through that. Let's leave that behind me. And now I'm ready for the next step then typically if you don't, if you don't get the message, you, you don't really get to move to the next step. So yeah. Um, yeah, all those lessons, man, I know I'm throwing a lot of it in there or what I learned and then I'm trying to pass on. And, and to your point about being a coach, now I can say, Hey, yeah, guys, I, I made it a little bit. I can help you out with your baseball stuff, but like, let's talk about adversity and let's talk about how we handled it. And let's talk about, you know, life off the field. And so it kind of gives me a great avenue to speak into those young men's life. Yeah. You, you have those accountability people around you to kind of corral you because it, like you said it's it's tough to to do that to be out and doing it because you know the temptations and everything else are there but you know you talk about just putting it away and moving on no you'll never do that because it's a scar that you're that's that's permanent that's the whole that's what a scar is it's something permanent it's just a reminder but it also tells you understanding hey i know what that feels like so when somebody does come to you with a question about a you know um uh, you know, some sort of uh, issue that you're dealing with, to just be, hey, you know, to talk about, I know mental health these days is, is a really, really big thing, especially among the younger generation. And to be able to talk to these kids yeah. and just tell them, I mean, that's what I talked about earlier was you can't Google that. You cannot Google this stuff. You know, you can hear part bits and pieces of it, but you really want the answer, you go to the source. And I think that's the beauty of what, you know, what you're doing because, hey, you can tell these kids, I've been down that road, right? And, that, and you talked about... Um, who your friends are and then the people that 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 have been there draw circles they don't draw lines right and i think that's what you were talking about the people drew lines and said nope that's it when you know i'm cutting you out of my life that's it plain and simple and that's you know and that's fine i'm sure some of it hurt you you know you said being through it of doing that and understanding but at the same time hey it's just you look at god and you go hey that's just that's just somebody that doesn't need to be in my life. So that just, you know what, we, what do you do? It's one step forward and you keep moving and able to do that with these kids. Um, and I'm sure you hear stuff. Kids ask you really what, you know, I'm sure to have kids wanting to even get in depth with you and wanting to understand because kids are smart, right? They can see the forest through the trees. And have, have you had to deal with any, any of the kids coming and saying something to you about it? Have you had to deal with anything to that effect? Yeah. You know, I think typically, I can tell there's this overall like underlining. They don't want to mention it or talk about it. And I'm always real open about it. Like we'll have program meetings and I'll share my testimony or, you know, I'll go share different places. So basically everyone knows, like you said, I mean, Google became my worst nightmare <laughs> at one point. I was like, Oh, I hate Google now. But uh, if people be like, Oh, I went to see what teams you played for. And I'm like, and yeah, yeah let's talk about it. And so, um, you know, they will, but I'm so open about it and I, and I get ahead of it that I think it allows them the comfort of that, I'll, you know, make a little comment and then they'll go, oh, yeah, what about that? Hey, and they'll start asking more questions about it. And, you know, with youngsters, it's it's usually more like, oh, did you get in fights? Oh, was there this? Was there that? And it's like, you know, I don't really want to go too much detail or glorify the, the politics behind, you know, what that looks like, but more like, hey, guys, um, we think we're kind of a big deal, you know, and at the end of the day, 
life just kept right on going, man. It was like, I'm sitting in here in the cell and there's no like every day, like, Oh, it's just life keeps going without you, man. You pluck, pluck me out of there. And, and yes, family's sad. And I'm sad. And that's the worst part of prison is not being around your loved ones. Um, but you know what? everyone just keeps moving and keeps going. And so it's a good lesson because it's like, you know what, we're not really as important as we think we are. Um, you know, and it keeps you humble and it just keeps you kind of, kind of working towards that. And that, that's a big, was a big lesson for me is like, you know what, this is, this stinks and I'm gone. But at the end of the day, everyone just keeps on moving. And so now to be able to jump back on that treadmill of life and go, Hey, now I'm moving along again. And I often think of guys that are back there locked up right now going, man, no one thinks about them. Nobody understands that they're there. I mean, they're family, of course, but um, man, there's a lot of good people in there, man. She like talented, smart, intelligent, gifted men that just made a bad choice. And 99% of the time it's because they were, um, you know, affected by substance abuse, alcohol, whatever it may be. And um, it's tough, man. I just thought like everybody else, I'm like, dude, that's prison is just a place for bad people. That's where they belong. And then when I walked it out with them for a few years and, and, and granted, there's plenty of that, but um, there are also is certainly some some awesome human beings that just made a mistake. And some of those guys aren't getting out, man. They're sitting there right now. And and it's a it's a struggle. So I often think about guys like that. And then that also propels me to want to make the most of my days when I am free. It's like, you know, I'm like anyone else. Like, man, I'm tired. I don't want to get up and do this. <laughs> I don't want to go do that. You know, whatever. And it's like, dude, you would have done anything to have an opportunity to go speak to a baseball team or go shoot, go to the gym or do whatever when you were locked up so perspective is is huge yes it is and that's and that's the i think the beauty of you know you said what you've been through and able to to these kids if you know we can't change the world but if we if your if your testimony and your story helps one person you've done your job right because then that one person can help another person and, and you move on from there so i mean it's i think that's the beauty of it and like you said you're not you're on that treadmill of life. The first time you were on that treadmill, you were, it was just a full sprint. And then I always equate, you know, what we do in life as, as being in a speedboat, right? It's nice and great. We're flying across the water, but what happens when that speedboat stops? Everything that we've done, right? All those waves comes crashing up to us, right? Cause, because we just get ahead of ourselves. And I think that's part of what God's plan is. It's no, it's I'm leading the way, you know, we just about take a seat in the back and, you know, we all go through different, different, things to put us there and you know and, and you know everybody's story is is different but we're all on that same page we've all hit bottom and now our, our job is to you know you know pre you know pay it forward to these guys and and like i said hopefully your story is able to tell one person whether they're listening whether it's one of the kids that you're coaching to say hey i know i've been there right i've know how to avoid that path right and we won't know for 10 12 years somebody comes up to you hey puff you remember that story you tell them that helped me. Right. And then all of a sudden as a coach, as somebody that, you know, that's been through it all, you go, that's the satisfaction more than somebody getting to, you know, to the ultimate goal, because you've been there and understand it's, it's that personal touch that all this stuff has. Right. Oh man. hundred percent. That's so well said, man. Cause I always say that I'm like, you know what, if my story can help one person I'm in, like if I go speak, the reason I wrote the book, it's like, it just helps one person I'm in. And then occasionally, man, God will give you that, like, email or that message or that dm on twitter it's like hey i was that one person today i heard you know whatever and it's like oh that's so awesome we don't always get that or we don't always need that or whatever because it's really not about us but at the end of the day when you get that little feedback it just it really energizes you man and like selfishly again being a guy that struggles with anxiety and just always has to be super intentional about my daily habits and routines otherwise my mind gets a little out in left field occasionally it's like that actually selfishly helps me man when i give it away it fills me up and not in a prideful, like, yeah, I helped somebody, but just like, Oh man, I can't believe God can still use me after the knucklehead I've been, man. It's just really encouraging. And so try to encourage others with that as well. Again, back to, man, you might've made a mistake as early. It might've been yesterday or whatever. I mean, cause we're going to make mistakes every day. It's like, you're not disqualified, man. God's got a plan for you. And yes, we need to work on changing our behavior and being humble and, and all and contrite and all those things. But we don't have to do that and then go, Hey God, what do you got? It's like, just keep walking with them. And just keep pouring it out. And he knows every day is a struggle. Um, some are better than others. But at the end of the day, just be real honest in your conversation with them. But the last thing we wanted to do, and I know I did it a lot, was isolate. Um, God's, God's probably ashamed of me. I don't even want to pray to him. Or, you know, I don't want to tell my family what's going on because they'd be ashamed of me. And I'm just find somebody that you trust, man, that you can just go, hey, I'm struggling. Like, this this sucks. And it's really cool because more and more people are getting real out front, like you said, about the mental health. Like, Jay Glazer's a big one for me. Um, he's just so open and honest about his struggles. The more people that do that, the more people can go, oh, 
Me too, man. I, I, now as men, we're, we're getting out there and, and being um, open about our feelings, which is like, you know, in the, in the locker room, it would have been like, oh, dude, what's wrong with you? But now it's like, no, man, this is good. This is getting out there and, and we're able to help more people. And so that will take away from, and I know I felt this, like, man, if you knew how screwed up I was, if you knew how what I think about, you'd never want to be around me. And then other guys are like, oh, you too? Yeah, yeah, I struggle that way too. And I probably could have avoided going all the way down that path if I didn't just keep everything to myself and be like, I don't want to let these guys down. I don't want to be a distraction. I don't want all those things. So just be real open about your struggles. And I think you'll, you'll be surprised how many people want to come along and encourage and help you. Yeah. Especially, you know, reading through the Bible, you look at the different stories, especially, you know, David, for instance, you know, look at what, what that, what he's, what he's done and everything else. And people, yep, I've done worse than that. So if he can use yeah. that guy, he can use me, he can use anybody. So that's, that's what you're, what you're, you know, what you're talking about as far as your story and how it can help. So how can people, you know, reach out to you, follow you, uh, the book and everything else? Can they, uh, yeah. and just listen, is there any way as far as social media and I'm getting you, I'm getting new to this social media, getting back into it and everything else, but is there ways they can follow you, hear about your story, find the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally, man. So I'm uh, brandonpuffer.com kind of has all that. Um, Coach Puff Positive is my Twitter without the E at the end. So Coach Puff, P-O-S-I-T-V, I guess, if I did that right. Anyway, <laughs> Brandon, but BrandonPuffer.com is all of it. My book is from the bullpen to the state pen. You can get it off the website um, or just go to Amazon and look it up and and check it out. But um, yeah, man, that's it. That, that's that's uh easy way. I'm big on Twitter. I have the other ones. Um, but yeah, I'm always out there. And then if, if folks are struggling or like, hey, I heard your thing, sometimes I'll get DMs. I'm happy to you know pray for folks, encourage them whatever I can do, man. Man, but I appreciate you jumping on here because, you know, these stories can help. And who, like I said, who knows how far this reach is uh, uh, with all that. But I appreciate you jumping on, Puff, and, and telling this story and just catching up. You know, like I said, it's been too long. I think sometimes we go through stuff and life, you know, we just, just keeps moving and we forget. Not so much forget, just, just you know, forget guys and, you know, just be able just to re, re, re-acclimate ourselves to each other and just see and, you know, kind of create this group again. Because, like, you know, as players, we don't draw, draw, draw lines, we draw circles around yeah. it. And I think that's just, that's what this is, man. But I appreciate you coming on here, telling this story. Um, and like I said, hopefully this can help somebody else out down the road. And I appreciate you wow. jumping on, man. And, um, you know, look forward to, uh, you know, seeing where this takes you and, uh, you know, maybe revisiting this, you know, in a few years of how, uh, how you're doing. So, but I appreciate it, man. Yeah, I know, Mitch. My pleasure, man. So awesome. Thank you for having me on. And and now that we're connected again, don't be a stranger for sure. Um, it's just an honor to be here, man. I hope that, like I said earlier, not a cliche that if you and I jumping on here, chatting, catching up, just encourages or helps one person be well worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. But I appreciate it. And I'll, and I'll be in touch, man. Okay. And good okay, luck. Okay, brother. Have a great day. Thank yes, you, Yes, sir. Thanks, Puff.